This week, I am extra excited about our first segment in Enterprise News because I'm joined by John Strand, and the news is really, really interesting to me this week. We've got a lot of great stories to cover, including Okta joining forces with Secret Double Octopus. Yes, that is the name of a security vendor. Tenable unveils some new innovations for cyber exposure analytics, which is way more exciting than the title sounds. Barracuda launches some bot protection features. Uh, Palo Alto it makes an acquisition. FireEye makes an acquisition. All very interesting. In our second segment, I'm excited about these segments as well. Uh, Ruvi Kidoff, he's the CEO and co-founder of 2Fin. He's going to talk about the importance of having a network-wide security policy in today's day and age of cloud. In our final segment, Jack Jones is the chief risk scientist at Risk Lens to talk about understanding and quantifying cyber risk using FAIR. That's capital F-A-I-R. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The Viavi Solutions Observer Platform provides SecOps teams a powerful combination of comprehensive data for threat hunting and incident response that includes wire data analytics and enriched flow records. Using pure, unaltered packet and net flow, Observer presents views across the entire IT infrastructure with threat alert features including scope, impact, and advanced traffic profiling. Teams can use automated workflows to dive into high fidelity network evidence and more quickly resolve issues, minimizing impact on customers, users, and business operations. Learn more about the Viavi network security solution and download free resources at securityweekly.com forward slash Viavi. That's V-I-A-V-I. Is the fear of a cyber attack keeping you up at night? Are you worried that your business isn't properly protected? Keep your network up to date and secure from vulnerabilities with VSA by Kaseya. Kaseya's VSA patch management module installs, deploys, and updates all of your software from a single console. Kaseya's network antivirus provides real-time updates and ensures maximum security. Start sleeping peacefully all night long. To watch VSA in action, request a demo today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Kaseya. That's K-A-S-E. EYA. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it enables security teams to detect risky user activity, investigate incidents in minutes, and effectively respond. Get your free trial at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Welcome, everyone, to episode 139 of Enterprise Security Weekly for May 29th, 2019. When we hear 139, we think NetBIOS, but, you know, I'm your host, <laughs> Paul Asadori, and I'm joined by Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. God, I heard that, and I think, oh, well, we should switch over to 445 for a more re- like right? a recent operating system. Uh, you know what I found interesting, and I don't know if you caught this, John, but the new remote desktop services vulnerability is CVE mm-hmm. 2008-0708. Did you catch that? Which like is, MS- which is oh- awesome. 0807, yeah, yep. 067, right? It was kind of yep. like, I don't know. I felt like they like, named it. It's almost that like a call out a little bit. A like little bit. The last really good remotely exploitable vulnerability that we had. Someone at MITRE was sitting there going, ha, 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 gotcha. <laughs> You got to love them. That's it. But no, dude, it is so good to be back on the show. Uh, for those of you that uh, come up to me at conferences and ask if I quit the show, that is not correct. Um, I've just had a lot of travel between active countermeasures and SANS and IONS and everything else that's going on and B-Sides events. It, it's just been it's just been crazy. You so. have a lot of roles that require a lot of travel. Like simultaneously, well, you're filling these roles that all rec- – I mean, I'm SANS, <laughs> active countermeasures, and BHIS – all require well, some level of travel. And that and that's one of the reasons why I'm stepping away from the SANS Institute. And by the way, Josh Wright, a good friend of ours out in Rhode mm-hmm. Island, is going to be taking over SANS 504. Mm. And uh, that's the main reason. Is SANS is responsible for about 80 days a year sure. um, that I'm on travel. So this gets me home that much more. And it's going to be great to be able to be on this show, do more webcasts. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Speaking of webcasts, we've got ones uh, three coming up with SaltStack, Logarithm, and Domain Tools. You can register 
for those at securityweekly.com forward slash webcast or go to slash on demand if you missed one. Uh, and now the news. I want to start off nerdy, John, because we haven't chatted in a while and this is my way of working this into the news. Uh, okay. So I, I built some computers lately and I want to get your take on this uh, especially. So I did the new Intel Core i9-9900K processors. Yeah, now, dude, I totally skipped right over this because this was totally a uh, Paul Azadorian thing yeah, but now, um, they, when they, I saw this. Bear with me now. Bear with me. Okay, and listeners, okay. bear, bear with me, right? So I did one with 16 cores and 120 gigs of RAM, one with eight cores and 64 gigs of RAM. And let me tell you, these things, like, they absolutely fly. Now, their new one that's in this announcement is the 9900KS will allow you basically every single core will allow you to go to five gig. So in the original one, it only lets you go to five gig as a core clock speed, but your cores still run at the slower clock, sp clock speed. No, clock speed, uh, talking about right. chickens. Um, and so what I'm saying is if you're doing security analysis analytics, you're running a lot of VMs, you're running a lot of containers, you're crunching through logs, doing some kind of analytics, this is the platform for you. I mean, there is no hesitation in all the heavy lifting tasks that I do, John, like stuff just runs. I feel like this could also crack passwords pretty well. You might not even need that many video cards and you could probably still get, I mean, with 16 cores, you're not going to rely as much on the, the GPU and your CUDA cores when you're doing this processing. And and I and I think for some situations, you know, it's about it's the right tool for the right job, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever you're looking at that floating point arithmetic uh, that GPUs bring, where modern like 1080 can bring 5,000 GPU cores to bear, um, doing something like doing a simple function, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that you're going to use GPU cores for that, of course, still. Um, but you start getting into some of the stuff that doesn't fall into that category sure. of just doing the same function again and again and again, like calculating water or light or shades or passwords. And you start getting into some heavy analytics. Uh, I'll just use Rita as an example. Mm -hmm. um, something like this, Rita would just scream on mm -hmm. because of the way it's actually handling the data sets is far more complicated. Um, like I would say an elk stack. Uh, yeah. This would be a great system for running a full elk stack and doing that type of analysis. Um, on those as well. So and, it's, a, you know, it's always about the right tool for the right job. And, you know, you can never have too much CPU uh, right. horsepower. Ram, you can right? never have too much memory. Yeah. 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 And I think that um, it, it, the cost is really, really good too, right? Like it didn't cost a fortune to build these systems, right? With that much RAM yeah. and that much CPU. And we we're talking about like between $3,000 and $4,000, um, which if you're trying to do this kind of calculation in the cloud, you, you could run up quite a bill on your CPU oh, compute, yeah. right? So yep. that's why well, I stuck it in there for enterprises, right? <sighs> Especially as a security analyst, if you're doing this kind of work, you're going to want to consider this new the new Intel platforms because I've built two of them and I'm in, like, in love with them. Well, and we've done, you and I have done a lot of, you know, heavy lifting in the cloud. And we have mm -hmm. seen those bills come through unexpected of like, you know, this is a $20,000 bill this, yes. this month. Yes. And uh, Everybody's like cloud for everything. And in fact, a lot of our shows our notes today are cloud based. Mm -hmm. You everything shouldn't be running in the cloud. There are some things that you're going to need some dedicated horsepower to be working on locally. Absolutely. Uh, so Okta has uh, not acquired. I'm sorry if I said that in the beginning. Okta has joined forces. Yeah. Partnership with Secret Double Octopus, uh, who I did a briefing with. Great company. Awesome people. Great technology. One of the things I really liked um, is their goal is to get rid of the password, right? Basically create multiple factors that don't require you to remember your password. One mm -hmm. of the things they do that I think is really cool is if your smartphone doesn't have uh, a biometric sensor for fingerprints uh, mm -hmm. or any other biometric sensor, they patented, they take a picture of your four fingers and they read uh -huh. your fingerprints from it. And I thought that that's was really cool. smart. And that's why I mentioned it here on this show, right? If you're in a large enterprise, you've got 50,000 users, right? The chances that someone has even a company issued phone that doesn't have the fancy new biometrics is quite likely. Uh, so I like their technology because it's really flexible like that. And I think if you're using Okta, you're looking into some kind of multi-factor, right? Because you log into Okta, yep. you've got access to every single application in your role, potentially. Um, and you have to put some kind of MFA. On that. I mean, you yep. should, you don't have to, but you should, right? So I think it's a yep. good partnership. So I love Okta and I, I love uh, 
double secret or secret double octopus uh, and what they're doing. I think it's fantastic. But one of the concerns that we have with many of our customers is we have customers that say, okay, we're going to use two-factor authentication. Now we can reduce our password complexity to like seven characters. In fact, the PCI standards say that that is the minimum of seven characters, and that's absolute insanity. Mm -hmm. And anytime you implement a technology like this, it doesn't mean that you can reduce another technology. Eventually, it would be great if we could get rid of passwords completely. I think that that's a, that's a noble goal, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Right. So if you're implementing MFA, whether you're using Secret Double Octopus or you're using Okta or any of those things, you need to always keep that good, strong password complexity in place. And the reason why is the only way that you could reduce your password complexity is if you can guarantee that you have two-factor enabled absolutely everywhere. So when right. we're testing companies, we see lots of situations where they'll have two-factor enabled. I'm just using OA and Mail Sniper as an example. They'll have their OA portal with two-factor authentication, something like Duo. But then Exchange Web Services has it completely disabled. Or they have it enabled for, let's say, logging into SharePoint, but it's disabled for a VPN. Mm -hmm. So whenever you use two-factor, the rule is try to enable it absolutely everywhere, and you are not allowed to reduce your password complexity until you've guaranteed and tested and validated and vetted that there is no place in your organization with just single-factor authentication. And so there these are, are some, great technologies, but be careful. It's a great point. And there are some solutions that generate uh, like 64 or whatever the max string is, random password mm -hmm. for the user uh, and yep. use that and then change that password out. Like some of the... I feel like BombGar that's now beyond trust, right? As a solution, yep. like when admins uh, log in, they automatically roll a password for them and then change that password or and expire the password when they log out. But what you're saying is you have to, if you're doing that, you likely you've done it you know, everywhere, but make sure that you're doing it everywhere before yep. you go get rid of your passwords well, or make them separate characters. That and I think that that's another great point because a lot of times these services that exist that don't have two-factor authentication enabled are usually services that users never use. They don't even know that they have an account there. Yeah. They don't even use that particular API. So right. if you can set up that random password, switch to a two-factor device, and the user doesn't even know that they have a password, but it's 64 characters, it's random, then that's that's great if you can actually do that for sure. Uh, Palo Alto has bought Twistlock. Twistlock is, of course, a container security company mm -hmm. and we saw this coming for a while yeah didn't we? my assessment of the market and i've done briefings with a and of course you know matt is all in the container space because that's where he, he was previous to security weekly um twist lock and aqua were kind of like neck and neck in terms of enterprise features i think there's you know some advantages depending on which technology you're using and there's some features i think aqua definitely has some some really good features that probably push it ahead in a lot of uh, enterprise deals, but Twistlock is right there, right? And so yep. basically Palo Alto, you know, bought one of the major competitors, right? Uh, one yep. of the top competitors with the most features in container security for hundreds of millions of dollars. We don't have much uh, insight, <laughs> but I mean, that, those are my insights from doing briefings with, uh, you know, a few different container companies, uh, container security companies. Aqua's got a really, really a uh, rich platform that does a lot, ties a lot of things together for your DevOps uh, tool chain. And Twistlock yep. was right there. So, Well, and this makes sense, right? Because if you look at traditional firewalling, I, I know I'm going to get some hate mail from this, but traditional firewalling is dead, right? The idea that you have a DMZ, you're protecting stuff coming in and you're protecting the stuff going out. There are so many reasons why that particular model was broken. And Marcus Random has even talked about it years ago sure. about how we implemented firewalls was fundamentally flawed. And now with the cloud, it's even more fundamentally flawed. And that's why Palo Alto moving into this particular space and getting into that cloud, getting into the container, working with Twistlock just makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. Because I'd like to believe, Paul, even though I think I'm mistaken, is it possible that this time around with like APIs and services and containers that maybe just maybe that it would be possible that we could get the concept of firewalling correct this time. And when you see Aqua, when you see Twistlock, I get a little bit of hope. But then again, we start finding some vulnerabilities in the way that containers are actually spun up, especially with auto scaling groups. We haven't released some of these things yet. And we fall back into the same trap. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a great move for Palo Alto. It's a logical move. I don't think Palo Alto could have built their capability up to compete with Aqua or Twistlock fast enough. So this is just a good move all the way around. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's see. FireEye buys Veridin. Uh, 250, million, 250 million cash and stock deal. Oof. I will say this. I've done 
a briefing, mostly demos as well, mo almost all of them demos as well with every single breach and attack simulation vendor. Um, and it's interesting. Veridin, I, I, I put them in that category, but they're not really in that category. They've got a very unique spin in that they really talk to your security um, technology and mm -hmm. they can say this attack you know wasn't seen in these logs here's how you configure it to do so you know this attack wasn't blocked by this other defensive technology and they do a really good job of that and for that reason they were my pick for if you were an enterprise right and you wanted to enable your teams to do this testing on the fly and constantly test their security architecture Veridin was my choice uh and now they have been bought by FireEye so. Well, and let's also kind of step back. This this entire model is really cool. There's a lot of players in here. If people are looking for products, you know, we got Scythe is in this place, and we know we know Scythe really well. Um, when you're looking at vulnerability management, we're going to have Tenable twice in this mm -hmm. uh, new segment that's coming up. The idea of traditionally scanning for an existing vulnerability, a missing patch, is really only part of the story. And when you're looking at something like a Scythe or a Veridin, and you can start testing lateral movement, the ability to detect command and control, the ability to detect delivery and standard exploitation that is not exploiting a vulnerability, I, I think that that is where the vulnerability management space has to get into. And if you're looking at Verit and if you're looking at Tenable, I don't think that anybody has merged those two concepts of traditional vul vulnerability management, which is still incredibly important. And then merging it with something like Verdin or Scythe or something like that saying, okay, these are the vulnerabilities post-exploitation. This is kind of behind the CVE. We haven't seen that really solid integration between those two worlds yet. Um, but this also makes sense for FireEye. They're doing a lot of forensics. They're doing a mm -hmm. lot of services. And seriously, this is, this is going to be an easy sell for FireEye to work an incident, walk through that incident and say, okay, here's a product that you can now implement that'll continuously test your organization, not for the existing CVE vulnerabilities, but also attack path simulation. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just it's just a brilliant purchase. This has been a good week for news stories. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, it's interesting, John, there's almost like three areas of um, making a vulnerability analysis or exposure. I, yep. I mean, it, you know, we kind of poke fun at Tenable for the cyber exposure thing, right? But mm -hmm. when I was at Tenable, I would really call them exposures, right? Because it could be a missing patch. It could be yep. a messed up configuration or it could just be the like base configuration of your security tools and maybe your operating systems just allows for attackers to run rampant, right? And yep. you don't know if you tweak that thing on your endpoint security system and you tweak that thing on you know, some other security technology that it actually slows an attacker down. I think the company that can combine all three of those, right? Because I'm kind of surprised that well, I'm first surprised that Core Security couldn't make the pivot into this space because they would have been they were they, they would have been right, right there. there dude. They would have been first to market with a technology like this. And I don't pretend to know all the reasons why, but it you know that fell short. Well, and I think that if you can provide a solution that says, "Look, I'm going to help you make sure all your patches are applied, vulnerability scanning, configuration, and do some simulation to continually test all the things." Like if you put those pieces together and there's holes in them. Now breach and attack simulation can find that. That's yep. really where enterprises need to be today. Yeah. And we've been working um, very, very closely with uh, James and Kelly Tarala. Mm -hmm. uh, they're taking the 20 critical controls and tying it into the MITRE attack technique matrix and the unique numbers. And then also working with Scythe uh, so that we can emulate a lot of those different attacks. And what's been working for our customers, and this is all hodgepodge and spreadsheets at the moment, yep. where we can do breach simulation, whether it's custom stuff that we do at BHIS or we're using Scythe, and then tie it to MITRE, and then tie MITRE to the 20 critical controls, and then we can cross-reference that to every audit framework. What that buys for an organization, if you can do this properly, whether you're using Veridin or mm -hmm. whatever, what happens is now you can go to executives and say, we need this defensive technology. And by the way, this isn't just a hacker saying it. This isn't just a scanning tool telling us that we need to have this technology for defensive uh, capabilities like user behavioral entity analytics, mm -hmm. things like that. It now can be tied to actual compliance frameworks uh, like ISO, NIST critical security controls, all of those. So it gives you a much stronger position if you're a CISO, because we have a lot of CISOs, so many CISOs uh, that listen to the show, that it puts them in a much better position 
for trying to get the funding that they need in their organization for the products that they need in their organization than just saying, hey, a pen tester told me or, hey, this product, I ran a scan and it told me. You can now say that there's 43 compliance frameworks that require this and we're not in compliance with any of them. That makes a much stronger argument if you tie it, uh, tie it across better. What's exciting for me, and this, this came out of my interview with Jabra, um, and is that, you know, us as security researchers and pen testers, we're like, you know, if I develop this technique, pretty much I can get in a lot of the time and like pretty much no one's really configuring their environment to prevent against this, right? What well, MITRE ATT&CK is helping foster primarily is now putting that in the radar of enterprises to say, look, mm -hmm. it's not just enough to say, yeah, I applied all my patches and yeah, I configured some stuff and like now I'm secure and I'm watching some logs. It's like, no, there's an entire matrix of things that are basically techniques that uh, attackers are using that you have to account for somewhere in your security program. And these are things that John, you and I, and a, a lot of people in the community have been like jumping up and down on stage and going, you really need to fix this stuff in your Active Directory environment, right? Now we've got, in what you just described was more along the same lines of a standard framework to say, look, this is how you achieve a more secure environment to protect against those, what were before, I think, esoteric things, right? Now they're things on the radar of auditors and CISOs, which is important. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, Miter and, and, and I, I need to clarify here, or Kennedy is going to hunt me down. For the first time with the MITRE attack technique matrix, we finally have, I don't want to say a comprehensive, but the beginning of a comprehensive view of techniques that adversaries use, mm -hmm. uh, be it pen testers or attackers. And once we have that taxonomy, it's no longer this, this tribal knowledge that only a handful of people yeah. in the world know how to use. Right. It's something that can be emulated and repeated. Now, the trap is, and this is something Kennedy talks about all the time, and we were talking about it at New York at the ISC Squared conference, uh, not New York, uh, DC, is people then write signatures for the examples that are in MITRE or the yeah. Atomic Red Team from Red Canary. And that's getting us back into the blacklist check. And that's not what these frameworks were meant to be. No. So if you can detect these things, that's great. But it also requires us to understand that they're examples. They're not comprehensive blacklist. And if you can detect exactly what MITRE or Atomic Red Team tells you, you can detect everything because that's not the truth. Yeah. Um, we have to go back to our architecture. And I really think that's where Veridin shines. Like you said, they basically tell you, here's what you can do to your SIM. Here's what you can do to your firewall to stop this class of attack instead of saying detecting this specific signature base. Yeah, yeah. Signatures are bad in this in this context. I signatures agree. are just bad. Yeah. And you have to be careful with the MITRE ATT&CK framework as well because if you secure it just to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, then you're only defense is against if someone's using those, what's in the yeah. exactly what's in those the those specific attack. signatures right, right. but exactly. if you if you take a step back and i think jp cert did a really good job of this mm -hmm. with uh their tools analysis is they didn't say okay here's the specific powershell detection they took a step back and said okay here's how you can detect powershell attacks uh eric conrad with deep blue cli yeah and the work that he's done on that it's not detecting a specific thing but it's detecting classes of things and i think that that's a better approach absolutely uh, let's see if you're using Barracuda and their WAF product, they've now got uh, bot detection built into that. It's unclear whether they uh, licensed know, or uh, so basically this is like distill networks, uh, bot okay. detection, right? Now, is this put in like, okay, so they spent a lot of time talking about this, talking about bots and spam and things like that. Are they also, cause I, I, the, the one thing that makes sense to me for bot detection is scraping like people come mm -hmm. into your website with bots and scrape off your content steal your content repost it do price matching beating your price like that makes sense but then they spend a lot of time talking about uh ddos protection and it, a lot of really old school bot defenses that doesn't make much sense to me yeah the the ddos defense is is probably not the right place or this isn't the right place to talk about the the yeah. ddos uh prevention this is more yeah. about bots, uh, in my Web opinion, screen. John. Yeah, preventing that. So I, actually, in an upcoming tech segment, I'm looking at uh, a phishing email I got on American Express. And it, they, in, uh, other reports say they scraped FedEx too, right? So if you can cut down on the number of bots that are scraping your site, then conceivably you could cut down on the attacks against your users, right? So this isn't really so much of uh, an enterprise network security play as it is 
protecting your application and the users of your application, right? I'm a user of American Express. I want to make sure that attackers aren't able to go after me as easily, right? So they'll put in some bot detection, make sure you can't scrape the site, impersonate users. Uh, and you know, that, that makes a thing. lot more sense, yeah. right? That makes a lot more sense. And this gets into, you know, we, we, we bring it up almost every single show, a poorly worded release, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking, if you're writing these up, if you're somebody that's listening to this show and you do marketing, if you're writing this up and you start talking about bot protections, Try to find something that's relevant to modern problems. And don't get me wrong, DDoS is absolutely a modern problem, but it's not something you're going to solve with a Barracuda firewall. Mm. If somebody throws enough uh, packets at your network, you're going to lose every single time with that. But if you're talking about the scraping, you're talking about impacting uh, performance on the website, you're talking about you know pulling pricing information, that makes a lot of sense to a lot of security people. Uh, Tenable is uh, has changed the Nessus license, and I mean, it, it, or this Nessus Essentials, this which had was to happen. Nessus yep. Home, right? I think it's yep. Tenable getting more in tune with the community, which is really nice to see. Obviously, I was much closer to these announcements uh, in my previous role when I was at Tenable. Uh, now I'm on the outside looking in, as it were. Uh, my good friend uh, Renaud Darson is quoted in there. Uh, basically, the gist of it, and I think Renaud's quote sums it up, right? He says, "Nearly every cybersecurity professional has used Nessus at some point." maybe even learn the fundamentals with Nessus. The vision mm -hmm. is that Nessus Essentials is to advance the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Whether it's in the classroom or on the job, they're going to give back to the community uh, and help close that gap. And I mean, it, it, at first I was like, really? And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh yeah, like I learned about a lot of really cool attacks because I scanned some stuff and I looked at the results and I'm like, wow, what's that? I got to go research that. And like, well, wait, how does that attack yeah. work? Right. So I think it really can uh, foster kind of your skills development because at first you're going to get a tool, you're going to scan and start analyzing the results and you're going to learn a lot from that. And now they've opened up the license uh, a bit and I don't pretend to know all of the details there, but I do actually, um, I actually got some stories about mm. this. Um, so we've been using, uh, Nessus in 504 and 560, uh, for SANS for years. Mm -hmm. And the traditional way that we had to make it work was Renault would cut us a key we would install Nessus, update the plugins, and then we'd have to do some magic that I'm not going to get into. And then it would work. And it would never have to touch the tenable mothership, yep. never have to be outside of the network. And I think you first brokered this. I before you may or may not be aware of such sorcery. Yep. But yes. Yep. So, <laughs> so we had to do all this stuff. Well, we started getting into problems. And this is kind of funny. It always seemed to happen like the day before a holiday. Mm -hmm. And like something would break. Like it wouldn't be the plugins would expire. But if Nessus waits so long before reaching back to the mothership for updates, not for plugins, mm -hmm. it'll basically say, look, I have not talked to the Tenable mothership in X number of hundreds of days. I'm done. I I'm just not going to work. And then I'd get on the phone with Renault and emails would go back and forth. And then we'd have to do all these quick janky things uh, to get stuff to work. And Renault promised us the last run that this was coming out a long mm. time ago. That's good. And it, if you look at it, it's completely designed for like educators and people mm -hmm. that want to learn. And this is perfect for like 504 and 560 because awesome. it's just going to work for us. So I, I think a lot of it has to do with Renault is getting tired of getting phone calls and emails panicking. Um, like Christmas Eve and uh, yeah, Thanksgiving, yeah. but it, it, it's it's awesome that Renault well, and team at Tenable is still giving back to the community. As I much mean, as they think are. about how long Nessus has been around and how many people have even licensed Nessus over the years and maybe not updated it, and that's why that oh, that right. check had to go in because, I mean, it's similar to Microsoft, right, um, mm -hmm. or Apple. I mean, you've just been producing technology for so long that you end up with a larger and larger population that's just never updating, uh, which can, yeah. which can slow you down. So, and the easier they make it for educators and mm. students to use their product, the more of those people are going to just say, that's the product we use every single day. And that's just a good approach all the way around. Now, Tenable has announced a new way to prioritize vulnerabilities. Um, I, I have heard rumblings. This is interesting. I didn't know. So explain this. How does this work? Uh, I'm not sure ultimately how it works. Um, I know. So what they say in the article is that um, they're producing a new score. It's called the Cyber Exposure, exposure Score, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But they say it's an objective measure of cyber risk derived through data science measurements of vulnerability data together with threat intelligence and asset criticality. So it's more huh. of a real priority. Like a lot of this stuff, people would write code on their own 
to produce a score that was relevant to them, right? So they'd come in and have a CVSS score. Then they go, okay, what asset is that vulnerability on? Okay, that asset contains you know, really critical data. So therefore maybe it's really important, but we also have this compensating control and our threat feeds uh, see someone trying to attack that vulnerability, take all of those factors into account and go, okay, you got to go patch this first, right? That's essentially a very simplistic way of, of boiling it down. Now in the past, other vendors, um, uh, Kenna and, uh, I think risk sense too, right? Which is one of our interviews today. Um, there's a couple of different ones, right? Would come up with software that an, that does this for you, right? Um, so now Tenable and assuming Qualys and Rapid7 are also working on ways to provide this inside the platform uh, because it was something that customers always, they would label it as you've heard this before, right? Like reporting is terrible. And, and this is really what they were talking about is not just reporting, but help me prioritize my vulnerabilities and give some real context to them. Uh, and so that's what uh, Tenable has announced. There's a couple other things in there too, but that's the gist of it. So awesome. If you're a tenable customer, you should absolutely be looking at this because I've fielded calls from a lot of enterprises that are like, so we're, we've got a lot of time and resources into this custom software. Like, can we just go to a vendor because we're tired of maintaining it, right? Or we're shopping around, spending more money on another vendor when we've invested in a vulnerability management company that doesn't do this for us, right? It's basically yep. the, the gist of that. Uh, it, I, I don't understand. I I mean, I guess I do. So Extreme Networks unveils an IoT security uh, and automated threat mitigation. I, my whole thing, and nothing against Extreme, like I'm sure they've built something really cool. Um, it's a really cool company and all, but I, I feel like, John, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me here, right? People are still struggling with like WannaCry and, and BlueKeep and getting these patches of these some of these legacy window systems and also what we talked about before locking down their environment uh to prevent these attacks that again has that tribal knowledge behind it um, but hasn't leaked into their networks and or the security of them hasn't leaked into their networks and a lot of vendors are just talking about iot security and i'm like really like i i mean i get it there could be iot devices on your network that could cause problems but I, I, most of our issues in security today are people and social engineering and email phishing and not patching and configuring and locking down your environment in a somewhat traditional sense i think iot and a lot of these other threats john are kind of like not on the radar for a lot of enterprises well and i and i think there's two ways to look at it um first with mirai um came out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. The Mirai botnet was loud and flashy and specifically targeted IoT devices. And it, it, it's a flashy news story that gets the attention of executives. Um, but the core is you can't just fix your network and then the IoT Mirai problem goes away. Because right. Mirai at its core was a um, DDoS attack. Yep. And once again, at that scale, that's not something you can fix. And also all the IoT devices that it took over weren't in standard enterprises. It was a whole bunch of home users and weird ISPs, onesie twosie yeah. things. ISPs, it was just weird. But it was flashy and it was a news story, so we're going to ride that as much as we can. That's one thing. The other thing um, that I think is really, really, really interesting if, if we step back is IoT is without question a massive issue um, in organizations, but it's not from an external exploit gain access perspective. It's basically a perspective of, um, uh, let's say you're running this IoT device, there's remote access into this IoT device that you didn't know about, your vendor gets compromised and then they have access to the internal network. Right. Um, what would it be a team viewer? would be yep. a great example. TeamViewer yep. was compromised last week or two weeks ago. And a bunch of these IoT devices and different embedded platforms will use something like TeamViewer for remote maintenance and monitoring of the of whatever the thing is, like the mm -hmm. X-ray scanner or the MRI or whatever the situation is. And that is where the risk really shows up in that hidden shadow IT in an organization. And I don't think it's something that can be fixed like, oh, well, we're magically running extreme and we fixed it. It's being aware, where are these devices? How are they beaconing out? What level of access do the vendors have coming back into your network? And I don't think that that's a simple solution um, that you can just simply wave a magic wand and it goes away. 
Yeah, I think much of the uh, solutions today are discovery based, as you said, John. Right? Yeah. Not so much, and I that's mean, great. The, yes, right? that's, that's awesome. a, for a good step in the right direction. Yep. Um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about? Uh, really quick. Tripwire cloud management. Uh, basically, my whole take on this, John, is, and, and a lot of vendors are are talking about configuration management of your cloud assets. We have some sponsors on the show that do that. There's a lot of announcements, mm-hmm. and like, how do you get a handle on generalization right cloud uh security management tripwire uh of course is playing in this space as well i and i think that a lot of us uh and i don't want to speak for everyone here but you know configuration auditing sounds kind of boring right like you know you got to make sure that all the little configuration things are there and then you know it's a tedious process and then it also carries the term auditing which a lot of us associate with really boring tasks of like Again, a tedious process of making sure all the little boxes are are checked, so it, it doesn't get as much attention as I think it should. And I really think that security, as we know it today, largely is going to be about configuration management. As we go to the cloud, containers, serverless applications, there's no more network kind of security. It's just the transport layer. Your security is going to be done in your configuration. So, and and I and I think this is huge. In fact, we're going to be having a webcast. Um, I think is Kent still here or did he take off? Okay, I'll I'll grab him later. So we have a we have a vulnerability in this particular space that we're going through a coordinated yeah. disclosure right now on, and I can't talk too many details about it. But this issue that Tripwire is getting into, and a lot of other container securities uh, uh, products are getting into, is monstrous. So whenever you're thinking of a configuration, um, many people think of configuration as I've configured my services, we're good. And Mm, that's great, but what happens when things start to auto-scale? Does your configuration scale with it, or do default configuration scale um, in like auto-scale workgroups? And we'll talk more about this as we can discuss it a little bit later with some specific vulnerabilities. But this problem is far greater, I think, than many people realize. And uh, just sit tight. We'll we'll talk about it sometime here in the new future. And I see Kent right now. Yeah, and I'm like go configuration, on dude, is quickly. everywhere. As I, you know, I I'm deploying an app with containers, and it's like you've got configuration for your Docker instances, configuration for your Docker Compose, which goes to configuration for your maybe your Kubernetes. Then you've got configuration for uh, the application itself. Then you've got configuration of Jenkins, and that ties in your configuration of Git hub maybe you've got docker hub and then whatever cloud platform you're deploying into also has configuration there's also like if you're us and you have an amazon rds instance there's configuration Mm -hmm. associated with that so like every little piece in your your devops tool chain has some type of configuration associated with it and that's really where it's going to be at it is that for many organizations it's that's security today and that really becomes a scenario where you have not just a moving target, but you have multiple moving targets. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the work that Ian Coldwater has been doing and the presentations that she's done, and I think she's just as burnt out as I am with travel, um, many people do not understand the, the truly dynamic nature no. of cloud and container security. And I think, Paul, even you and I would agree, we don't have a freaking clue either yeah. and well i'm getting better is because i'm filling in I'm for getting, the well i'm filling in for the developer now running, yeah so yeah. i'm wearing my so developer hat. i have to yeah but like i still so, i'm not deploying containers like directly into ecs on amazon yep. yet or into azure uh I, we're actually in a couple of weeks we're going to have a segment about deploying uh containerized apps into azure I think it's for security professionals, right? You got to understand it so you can talk to your developers. Also, if you've got security apps that you're writing, why not be deploying them inside of uh, containers? I mean, it is, once you get there, I think the opportunity to secure your applications and be more maintainable is there. But that journey, uh, I think, is what many of us are struggling with today, myself included. Exactly. Uh, really quick, uh, you know, one login has announced a, a partnership. Uh, I threw that in there at the, at the last minute. It's really, it looks like a services kind of announcement, uh, for one login with a partnership with Atlas identity an independent consultancy that specializes in cloud-based identity and access management, which is yet another piece of your configuration for your cloud-based yep. applications and, and, or your cloud infrastructure is configuring all of your authentication, authorization, for not just your users, but your applications as well, right? And that mm-hmm. that's another piece of it. There's actually a whole class of vendors that do just that. <laughs> some exactly. products of some vendors, right? But yeah, it's an important piece. Was there anything else, John? 
Oh man, I, I think that that's plenty. Uh, that I'll throw out. Uh, yeah, I'll throw out. I'm teaching a class at Black Hat uh, this year. Check it out. Are Cyber you not Deception. sold out yet? Uh, we're at seventy one percent. Okay. So they keep put adding us into bigger and bigger rooms. Mm -hmm. um, so d wouldn't worry too much about selling out per se. Um, Good for you. Because the awesome. last, yeah, was it three years ago we were in a room that could have sat like 200 people. So mm -hmm. just, yeah, just get it signed in and it'll be a good time. And, and you're teaching, uh, what is the, the gist of the class, John? I was in the announcements earlier, but. Yep, it's uh, cyber deception and attribution. So we'll be talking about a bunch of honeypot technologies and ways to just make attackers' lives oh, hell. I'm in love then, with uh, canary tokens. Holy oh, crap, right. are those things awesome, dude? We had yes. Haroon on the show, yes. and I actually yeah. implemented uh, a few of them. And I, Also, I really like that we talked earlier about the uh, American Express thing, and yep. I just want to mention quick in my uh, technical segments coming up, I'm going to talk about like if a company like FedEx or American Express had put something in their javascript that is a canary token you would get a notification if someone were to clone your site and start actually, trying to get people to log in i'm like that actually, that is cool actually we just we have a whole bunch of tokens that we're setting up on mm. bhis and we did get a token firing yeah um where someone it looked like our site. website yeah yes so and there goes a, you just put that in blacklist that from a spear phishing perspective and it's i, I always talk about it paul uh, getting into a tangent. When we started talking about cyber deception years ago and active countermeasures, the goal was real threat intelligence, not threat intelligence against what, something that happened to somebody else's network. But this is giving you threat intelligence yes. and what's happening on your network right yes. now. Yes. And that's what the class is all about. That's awesome. Cool. Well, with that, we're going to take a short break and come back with our interview with Ruby from 2Fin. Stay tuned. <laughs> 